The following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, August 9th, 2022, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Welcome, Jim. Good morning, good afternoon. Today, Jim answers the question, what will it take for inflation to fall and will the Fed pivot? Inflation is expected to return to 2%. Is transitory still alive? Yeah, so if we go to the first chart, uh, the thick black line on the chart shows you the inflation rate quarterly <clears throat> and that it peaks at 9.1%. All those various colored lines you see coming off the chart is a survey done by Bloomberg. So they ask roughly 60 to 70 economists every month, what is your inflation prediction over the next six quarters? And so you plot the median. And what you see is all those forecast lines, all those various colored lines, always converge at 2%. And that's very evident in the last year and a half. Wherever inflation has been since it's hit a pretty much 4%, people have been saying this is peak inflation, 4%, 5%, 6%, and it's gonna make a beeline straight back for 2%. So in that regard, if you believe these forecasts, or if you are one of these that your forecast is very close to this median, you're arguing inflation is transitory. We're gonna have a one-time blip up in inflation. It's gonna come back down to 2%, stay at 2% forever. That's it, it's all done. It was just an echo of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and by the way, what's interesting about that is that was the belief before the pandemic. During the pandemic, everybody thought inflation would rise to 2% and then level out. And post-pandemic, they think it's constantly gonna to fall to 2% and level out. So yes. Infl in transitory inflation still remains the dominant theme in the market. We're just not allowed to use that word anymore. It's the Voltamort of the financial markets, the word that cannot be said. But by and large, a lot of people still believe it. They still believe that this inflation rate is a temporary thing and that we will return to 2% and then we will stay at 2% for the rest of our life. Jim, what did we learn from the July payrolls? Yeah, so feeding off of this, and if we jump to the next chart, <laughs> the July payroll report was strong. 528,000 jobs were created, all more than twice what was expected, more, almost 100,000 jobs above the highest guess. 69 economists were asked by Bloomberg, what do you think the payroll report's going to be? The single highest guess was 325,000. Actually, I take that back, it was 200,000 above the, the highest guess. It was 250,000 above the uh, the median estimate. So any way you cut this report, it was unambiguously strong and it was above a consensus. But what this chart shows is probably the most interesting part of the report. The top panel shows monthly changes in average hourly earnings. Average hourly earnings, how much was the average raise for the month of July? It was up five tenths of a percent. Expected was three tenths. That is a four month high equaling the highest level since January. So not only did wages rise above more than people expected, but they rose to equal the highest number we've seen in the last several months. The orange line on the bottom panel, that shows you the year over year wage inflation. Now, basically since November of last year, it's been hovering between five and a half and 5%, and we're solidly in the middle of that range at 5.2%. With the strong July report, there's no evidence, at least by this metric, that wage inflation is backing off. So it's staying at around 5.2%. We jump to the next chart, more evidence that this is gonna be a, a not backing off. <clears throat> this is a complicated chart, but the top panel in blue shows you the number of unemployed people. Uh, that peaked to 23 million people in April of 2020, right, the height of the lockdowns and it's now down to 5.9 million people are currently unemployed. The Def definition of unemployed is you don't have a job and you've actively looked for one in the last 30 days. 
The orange line comes from the JOLTS report, Job Openings Labor Turnover Report. And it shows that there is currently 10.7 million un, um, open jobs. People looking for people to fill a job, 10.7 million. The second panel shows you that there is 4.8 million more jobs than unemployed. And the third panel expresses it the way the Fed likes to express it. It's 181%, the number of open jobs to the number of unemployed people, 1.8 jobs for every unemployed person. And you'll note that prior to the um, uh, prior to the pandemic, this was a number that was often less than one. That there was often more unemployed people than there was open job openings. Now that's completely flipped around. So if we jump to the next panel to kind of tie the, all of this together, the the next chart shows <coughs> the um, job uh, switchers versus job stayers. So the Atlanta Fed breaks down the wage growth number. Those people that have switched jobs, that's the orange line, have a 6.4% increase in their salary. Those people that don't switch jobs and just hope that their companies give them a raise or ask for a raise, they have a 5, a 4.7% um, increase in their salaries. So that the difference of 1.7% switching jobs versus staying is the highest since they started this statistic in 2000. And so what this shows us is that companies, because of all those open jobs, are paying up to get workers. That's why two charts ago, the wage growth numbers were so strong because we've got jobs to fill, we need people to fill them, there isn't enough people to fill them, so I have to entice somebody who's already working with more pay to get them to quit their current job and switch over to my job as well. And the last chart on this sequence comes from the unit, it's unit labor costs. It comes from the productivity report we're recording on the 9th of August, the day that the productivity report came out. Economists think that unit labor costs is the best metric all in for how much it costs to employ somebody. Their wages, their benefits, taxes, health care, everything balled up into one. That has increased through the end of the second quarter by 9.5%. So if you're employing somebody, it's going to cost you 9.5% more to employ them today than a year ago. Now, roughly 5-ish percent of that number was um, probably a raise, and the other 4% was probably increased premiums on health care and other benefits that you've had to give them along the way, not to mention if there's been any changes in payroll taxes, there hasn't been in the last year, but over the history of this charts, it has. And this is the highest we've seen since the first quarter of 82. So this is also at a 40 year high. So the takeaway here from the July report was wages are strong. There's a lot of open jobs. Companies are paying up to get people to switch jobs. Wages are going to stay strong. But Jim, can inflation fall without wage inflation falling? That is the question to tie the two together. So most economists think, as we talked about in the beginning, inflation is going to peak where for, since 4%, they've said this is the peak, it's going to 2%, stay at 2%. In order for inflation to go to 2%, at a minimum, you need wage growth to go to 2%. Simply put, if there is a 5% wage increase every year, we can pay 5% inflation. I get a 5% raise, prices go up 5%, I'm neutral, nothing has changed. In order to get 2% inflation, you can't give people giving, keep giving people a 5% raise in a 2% world. A 3% real increase, they'll start paying up for things and that will pull up prices. So at a minimum, you're going to need to see wages fall in order for inflation to fall, there's no evidence that wages are going to fall. Restated, the Federal Reserve will tell you what is the neutral funds rate. It's 50 basis points real. What does that mean? A half a percent above the inflation rate. Now, last week in Jay Powell's press conference, he said, or two weeks ago, excuse me now, <clears throat> he said that by raising the funds rate to two and a quarter to two and a half, they're roughly within neutral. 
That's because the Fed thinks the long run inflation rate is 2%, but it's not. It hasn't been. And if wage growth is five, it's not going to be 2%, the long run rate lower. It's going to be wherever wages settle out. The problem is wages seem to be settling out around 5%. And with all the open jobs and the bidding for employers, it doesn't look like it's going to weaken from 5%. If so, that might mean 5% is the new neutral. Half a percent above that, 5.5% is where the Fed would consider the funds rate to be neutral. And they've said in order to bring down inflation, we'd have to go above neutral. So we're looking at if these wage numbers don't weaken, we're looking at substantially more rate hikes, substantially more. As we record, the market has an 80% chance that the Fed is going to raise rates 75 basis points again at the September meeting for the third meeting in a row. Now, we're recording the day before the CPI report. If it comes in weaker than expected, those odds might change. If it comes in stronger, they might we might start be talking about 100 basis points if it comes in stronger. But as we're sitting here now, 75 for the third meeting in a row, which would take the funds rate to three to three and a quarter by September. And if wages don't start to weaken, we still got another 200, if at least 200 basis points to go before we get to neutral. So this whole idea that the Fed is going to pivot really starts with what anchors inflation. Your wage, your, your raise. If you keep getting 5% raises, you can pay for 5% inflation, and we're not going to get inflation down the two. Uh, and so if we continue to see this strong labor market and these strong wages like we've seen, we're going to continue to have higher inflation, and the Fed's not close to pivoting. Thank you, Jim, for your thoughts today, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you do have any questions, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.